I'd only been on the force for three weeks. Not even a month. When we got a call, I would never forget. I hoped that call would be the weirdest moment of my life. I never want to be involved with an event stranger than the one myself and my partner went through that night. We were working the night shift. My partner, a rough and gruff guy that went by the name Rusty. He was the type of person you don't want to mess with, and hoped would be on your side if anything went down. The perfect partner for a rookie like me, just learning the ropes and bound to be making a few mistakes. His teaching method was covering my ass once or twice, then expect me to smarten up. So far, I hadn't done anything wrong because our job was so boring that we simply couldn't. Nothing happened on a patrol in our small town in the middle of the night. Rusty wasn't much of a talker, so I took to doing crossword puzzles while I waited for my shift to be over. We parked along the highway, waiting for anyone that might be speeding, or any drunk drivers. If the cops in town needed backup, we would be called in. When the radio crackled to life, it made me jump. It had been so long since that happened, I had completely forgotten about it. My partner picked it up and answered back. I heard the dispatcher say we were needed to deal with an animal on the side of the road. Uh, what kind of animal? Rusty asked. This sort of wasn't our job. But if it was a deer in the middle of the road, we should drag it off before someone got hurt. We don't know. The caller just said it was large and they were too freaked out to stay. Dispatch answered. Rusty fell silent. A look I couldn't read immediately came over his face. Uh, what do they mean by freaky? I asked. Alright, we'll deal with it. Rusty called over the radio, ignoring my question. Rusty got the location, and we were off in under a minute. He never was one to talk much, but he was eerily silent as we drove down the road. It made me feel tense. If something was going on, I trusted my partner to tell me if it was important. I just prayed I put my trust in the right person. The car passed dark trees without any other cars on the road. Rusty put on the flashing lights, but not the siren. The silent view of the forest and the blue and red light made my skin crawl. I've never been this freaked out by an empty highway before. The spot was easy enough to find. Rusty parked a few feet away, leaving the high beams on the dead creature. I got out to take a better look at it. It looked long and pale, with some white hair and patches. Bloody spots on the road showed where it got hit first, and how far it was dragged along. Long, pale limbs sat on the road, about six of them, showing they didn't all come from just one animal. The issue was, I didn't know what the hell kind of animal this thing was. It reminded me of one of those mystery animals that washed up on the beach. Maybe it was deformed from being hit by a few cars. My mind just couldn't place what it looked like before it died. I found myself reaching out a leg to kick a hunk of the body when Rusty stopped me. Don't touch that yet. We'll clean up the arms first. Arms? I asked, stunned. He again gave no answers. Instead, he just shoved a pair of rubber dish gloves against my chest. I took them to put them on. Glad I didn't have to touch the limbs with my bare hands. I still didn't understand what we were collecting. Just toss them to the side of the road, Rusty said. He bent over and easily picked up one of the pale, long limbs to toss it into the ditch. A scream came to my throat and I forced it down. What he picked up had had fingers. 
And it looked a hell of a lot like a human arm. Just far too long. Rusty, that's... I started, unable to finish my statement. Just some animal parts. Don't get squeamish and watch for cars! Rusty replied, not looking over to the new rookie. Somehow, I did as I was told. I had to be seeing things. Rusty was not the type of man to mess around or ignore human body parts along the road. I walked over to a limb, expecting it to look different up close. It didn't, and I stared down at a severed, long, pale human arm broken and covered in blood from being dragged down the road. Unable to help myself, I ran to the ditch and got sick. As I puked up my dinner, I heard Rusty continue with his work, each arm making a loud sound as it landed in the tall, dry grass. I finally straightened up enough and got ready to confront him. Rusty, these are arms! We're dealing with a hit and run! I yelled tears in my eyes from getting sick. Boy, look at the creature over there. Is that anything natural? Something you've seen before? This is some weird shit and it's best if you just listen to me and don't think. His voice was stern, but not as harsh as I would have expected. The words caused me to stop and think. This wasn't the first time Rusty dealt with something strange like this. He knew what he needed to do. In order to avoid someone driving by seeing all this, he wanted to get it cleaned up. Then he would hopefully explain things. My eyes landed on the mystery creature still on the side of the road, now knowing it was something I would never fully understand. I wasn't able to touch the arms scattered down the road, but I could bring myself to drag the creature's body off to the side. I expected our task to be done, but Rusty told me to keep carrying the heavy, bloody body. We need to bring it into the woods for it to be reclaimed, he told me, not elaborating. Really? I said in a small tone. I did not want to touch this thing for much longer, rubber gloves or not. The strange thing gave off an odd, minty smell. That unnerved me, and I may have been able to deal with a rotting smell better. Rusty gave me a look, showing that dealing with the dead creature would be better than getting him angry. With some reluctance, I followed him and started towards the woods carrying the heavy, dead creature towards the trees. We thankfully didn't get too far into the woods. Tossing the corpse aside, we turned our backs and I started to walk away. But Rusty placed a hand on my shoulder to keep me from leaving. We can't leave yet. Keep your back turned. Don't look at it. No matter what you do, don't. Look at it. I opened my mouth to ask questions, but the look on his face made me shut it again. I thought Rusty could take down a bull with his bare hands if needed. And whatever we were dealing with frightened the man. And that made me dread the reason. If Rusty couldn't handle it, I had no chance. Swallowing hard and fear building, I nodded. We stared at the road in complete silence with our backs turned towards the woods. My body tensed as I expected every sound to be something coming from those dark trees to take our lives. My hands trembled. It took everything to not let my legs shake. I wanted to get as far away as possible from those dark trees. A sound came and I knew it wasn't an animal looking for food. Twigs snapped as something walked behind us. It was large, based on the sounds of the steps and the sounds of the heavy breathing coming from behind our backs. 
My body shook harder. A puff of air ruffled my hair, almost making me scream. Something so close behind us that I could smell it. Scared out of my mind, the thought of reaching for my gun to shoot it was extremely tempting. A tug came from the back of my belt. Whatever was behind us tried to get me to look at it by slightly taking a hold of my belt and clothing. Shutting my eyes tight, I refused. Another tug came stronger. It pulled me back a step, and I heard Rusty take an inhale of breath from worry. Planting my feet down, I pulled back. Eyes still closed, I kept repeating what Rusty said. Don't look at it. That was all I needed to do. From how scared I was, it should be simple. Then a set of hands placed themselves on my face from behind. All the tension disappeared as I felt them gently guiding my face to turn around. A warm feeling came over me as I forgot everything. I only wanted to see who belonged to such a warm set of hands. Even through my mental haze, I somehow managed to keep my eyes closed. A minty smell drifted over my face. The memory of the mangled creature came to mind, causing me to swiftly pull away, my eyes opening a crack as I did so. For half a second, I thought I saw something impossible. A tall thing covered in layers of veil, like fabrics with countless arms coming out from either side. Biting the inside of my mouth so I wouldn't scream, I faced away, the spell completely broken. We return the child to the forest. Let us go back to our work. Stop messing with my new partner. Rusty spoke in a voice not like his normal one. All force behind it, gone. Fingers ran down my back, causing a small scream to escape from my mouth. If this thing was messing with me, it did a damn good job. What felt like forever passed before a soft laugh came from the entity, similar to a whisper of wind. Then I could no longer sense something behind us. Rusty looked around, showing it was safe to do so. When I fearfully glanced back, I didn't see anything strange. Not even the body of the creature we carried over. What the fuck? I asked in a hoarse voice. <sighs> I'll explain in the car, Rusty said. Fine by me, I didn't want to stand out there much longer. We half jogged back to our patrol car, eager to leave. The bloodstains were still on the road, but anyone would just assume some animal got run over by a car. Rusty fumbled with finding his keys, so I got to the car first. After the strangeness of the night, I shouldn't have been taken aback at what waited for us there. A small boy wearing an oversized sweater stood near our car, his wavy hair down to his shoulders, and pure white instead of blonde like I thought at first. Not seeing him as a threat, I walked right over to him and got down on his level to talk to him. Why the hell was a kid on the side of the highway? Did someone dump him and he walked over to a cop car for help? I placed a hand on his head, trying to comfort him. I heard Rusty make a strangled sound. I ignored my partner and kept my attention on the child. Hey, little buddy, are you lost? I asked, trying to sound as friendly as possible. Through his long hair, I could see the boy's face turn beet red. His eyes met mine, and I nearly pulled my hand away, seeing they were red. Couldn't people have red eyes from certain medical conditions? Didn't albinos have red eyes, or was that only in animals? Uh, I'm sorry for my partner. Rusty rushed over to grab my shoulder and pull me away from the boy. I haven't told him anything yet. He explained in a frantic voice that didn't suit him. Clearing his throat first, the child spoke, trying to sound professional. It's fine. 
I dropped by to check up on how things are going. I've heard you recently got a new partner and wanted to ensure that he was aware of how things are in this area. The child said, recovering from his embarrassment. What are you two talking about? What is even going on? I asked, finally snapping a little from the strangeness of the night. They let me collect myself a little before the boy went on. This stretch of road in the forest around it has more than the usual supernatural activities. Your partner is well aware of them and how to deal with it all. At least, most of them. A lot of the creatures are dangerous, unless you know how to deal with them. For example, you could have been dragged off into the forest to become a forest partner of the creature tonight if you had given in and opened your eyes. The child explained in a calm voice. I looked between the boy and my partner, utterly confused. And why am I only finding out about this now? I asked. How would you react if I had sat you down and said there are things lurking in the woods without you seeing something weird beforehand? You wouldn't believe any of this. Plus, I've gone a year without seeing anything strange. I'd hoped you wouldn't encounter things so soon, Rusty explained. He was right. If he went on about supernatural things, I would think he was a nut and ask for a transfer. I might still ask for a transfer after tonight. Looking down at the boy, he appeared almost normal, aside from his hair and eye color, his bare feet not being dirty. A bit odd, though. I, uh, take it you're not human either? I asked. He shook his head. Whatever he was, he wasn't as scary as the thing that we cleaned up off the side of the road. I am important in the supernatural world. You're lucky to have met me. I just so happened to be in the area and dropped in. I I cut off his words by reaching out and placing a hand on his head again. I just couldn't help it. He reminded me of my little nephews who were the cutest kids in the world. That wasn't just the uncle and me talking. His face flushed again and with his bare foot he swiftly kicked me in the shin. Deal with the creatures on your own. No help from me. I hope you get eaten. He snapped, but it was hard to take him seriously. Just as the boy was about to stomp away, Rusty tried to recover the situation. Uh, he's new to all this. There's no way for him to know not to treat you like a cute kid. He defended me. But he is a cute kid, I said, not knowing I was digging my own grave. With a huff of frustration, the child turned heel and left. Rusty tried calling after him without any luck. I watched him stomp down the road, wondering how far to let him walk, until I went to get him to drive him home. I can't believe you offended the most powerful supernatural creature. Just a few seconds after meeting them, he said in disbelief. Huh? I glanced at Rusty, then turned to stare at the boy to find him gone. Looking over to Rusty, I silently expected answers. On the ride back to our spot on the highway, he explained a little. There were creatures in the dark. They killed and ate humans, making them extremely dangerous. Hell, killing and eating you may be the best outcome if you ever cross paths with a monster. Rusty's dealt with them since he started working along the stretch of highway. The boy we saw earlier was some sort of king. I really still didn't understand how important the child was. To lessen the king's workload, he gave the officers working this area information on how to deal with the local creatures. Rusty knew most of it, but things changed over the years, and newer creatures came along. Having updated information would help us stay alive. No one is forcing you to stay in this job. Rusty said to me. If I was smart, I would leave the moment I could. I felt still shaken from the encounter in the forest. I debated my answer for a few minutes. I could easily get a transfer, but would not enjoy leaving my entire life behind for a new city. Why do you stay? I asked my partner. 
job I signed up for. To serve and protect. Simple as that. We sat, letting the silence of the night fall between us for a while. A car or two drove down the empty road, unaware of what lurked in the forest nearby. I'll stay. If it gets too dangerous, I could leave. But I'm not leaving my new partner behind if I can help it. I said, confident in my answer. Rusty gave my arm a soft punch. And it was the most affectionate action he could bring himself to make. I was going to stay on the job for at least a little while longer. On some nights, we may catch someone speeding. Or I could get some crosswords done. And I may also be eaten by a monster, or worse. I felt fine with all that. It was mostly what I had signed up for, after all. I don't know why you do those crossword puzzles. It's not as if you can spell worth the damn. Rusty, my partner, grumbled. They help me improve spelling weird words. Besides, what else do you have to do all night besides help me with this? I asked, tapping his shoulder with a thick puzzle book. We worked as deputies for a small area. Most nights we just parked on the highway, waiting for something to be called in or ticketing speeding cars. Most of my shifts went by slowly, and I took up doing crossword puzzles. Rusty was right. My spelling needed work. Thank God for spell checkers. But the printed pages weren't as forgiving. I ended up asking Rusty how to spell a certain word or two at the start of the puzzle to keep me going. He acted tough and grumpy, but deep down I knew having a second person in the car beat being alone, no matter how much they pestered you for a five-letter word for five minutes. I would have liked our job to be boring forever, but in the first three weeks of working I discovered that things lurked in the dark. We came across something I still wasn't entirely sure of, and Rusty didn't want to overly explain it because he didn't want to scare off his new partner, or he didn't fully understand either. Though he did mention that supernatural occurrences didn't happen often, and we should be in the clear for a while. A sound tore through the night, followed by a car flashing by where we parked, swerving and darting all over the road. A second later, a call came over the radio, saying a drunk driver had been reported heading our way. I called over to say we were in pursuit, and Rusty gunned it. He always drove, and in this case I felt happy he did. The driver got spooked by a cop car suddenly pulling out from behind them. They did the dumbest thing possible and went as fast as their beat-up car would let them. Rusty stayed back a little way to be safe. If this car slammed in the brakes, we didn't want to ram into them. With drunk drivers, their actions were unpredictable. We followed the car on a wide turn and it disappeared for a second. When we came around, we saw the tail end of the crash. A white, large figure darted out into the road, stopping in front of the car. The driver didn't have a chance to avoid the shape. The car hit the figure, then went off the road into the trees. We drove by, unable to stop in time. When we passed the shape, I saw it looked like the same kind of creature we came across a week ago. Pale, white arms scattered on the ground, and blood covering the asphalt. Rusty pulled off to the side of the road, a bit away from the crashed car. We both got out, he went towards the creature's remains, and I went towards the car. The front end smashed, but the driver door opened with blood coming out from it. From the looks of things, the driver got out and stumbled into the woods. They needed medical treatment right away. I heard Rusty shouting for me to stop. 
My beating heart and breathing heavy from running made it impossible to hear his words. Sam, don't! I caught that much just before my foot hit the grass off the road. Then, nothing. The entire world changed in the blink of an eye, causing me to stumble. I tripped directly into a tree that had not been in front of me a second ago. The world so dark without the lights of our car. Grabbing the flashlight off my belt, I looked around trying to see what the hell just happened. I stood in the middle of the woods. That did not make any sense. I'd just been on the road and shouldn't have gotten this deep into the trees. I called out Rusty's name, hoping he heard me. My light caught a color that made my heart sink. Blood covered the leaves that littered the ground. I thought of the driver at once. There wasn't that much blood, but enough to make me worry and follow the trail. Low mist crept through the trees, which didn't make the place look any less unnerving. I walked, trying to stay as silent as possible. Maybe I should have asked for a transfer. I couldn't dwell on that kind of thinking, and needed to focus on finding the injured person so we could get the hell out of here. A shape between the trees caught my eyes. Pale fingers came out from around a tree to hold the bark, scratching at it with long fingernails. My mouth opened to call out to the person hiding, wondering if they needed help. Another hand came causing me to shut my mouth, and then another. Soon the entire tree became wrapped with pale hands from behind, each going upwards in a line, tearing at the bark. I couldn't even see how high the line reached. I wasn't having any of this. I turned and ran, no longer caring about the noise I made. My eye caught the trail of blood again. Against better judgment, I pivoted to follow it. As I ran, I kept seeing those hands coming out from behind the trees but not the source of them. A bundle of them blocked my way from following the bloody trail. Gritting my teeth, I ran right through them, nails scratching at my exposed skin, and one stole my radio from my belt. With everything happening so suddenly, I didn't think to use it until it was gone. At least I got through with only one long cut across my cheek. I run as a hobby, a weird hobby, I know, but it came in handy as I kept my pace away from the hands. I was only human and couldn't keep it up forever. I paused long enough to catch a second wind, frantically looking for the trail when I thought I lost it. My beam of light shone between the dark trees, landing on a different shape, something tall very pale, and covered in veil-like sheets. My chest froze. It reminded me of the quick glance of the creature I saw before. I turned my head, knowing seeing the creature in full meant a fate worse than death. A scream echoed through the woods, causing me to jump. I had my gun, but didn't think it would be useful. Still, my hand flew to my side, ready to draw it if needed. Any normal person would have run away screaming. I went towards it, ignoring the figure in the distance, silently watching. Screaming meant something bad was going down. My job was to help. Most people might call me either crazy or brave for running towards danger, but I never considered myself as either. I saw this as my job, and my job needed to be done. Fear still tore through my body as I ran towards the screams. Pleas for help kept my feet moving forwards. Along the trees, another sound drifted through. A cruel laughter 
enjoying my fear. I nearly tripped over an exposed branch, causing my body to go off course and slam into a tree. I stopped for a moment, dazed, sweat dripping down my face and heart racing. Something brushed against my hand, and I jerked away thinking a spider just crawled over it. To my horror, a pale hand darted back behind the tree. I wasn't even close to being safe in the slightest. I needed to keep going. Another scream rang out. I picked up the blood trail again to follow that, and the screams just praying I wouldn't arrive too late. In the middle of my run, I thought I spotted the road through the trees, causing me to stop again. The cries for help were so nearby, but in the other direction of the road. I didn't see any cars, or had any way of contacting Rusty. I left my cell phone in the car, and the hands took my radio. I could save myself, or keep trying to find the person in the woods. Regretfully, I stuck to my job. I'm close by. Please yell if you can hear me. I shouted, my flashlight scanning the trees with a shaking hand. I didn't hear the person, but caught sight of them. They were on the ground a few feet away, bloody with clothing torn. I shouted when a pair of hands grabbed them, dragging the person deeper into the woods. I ran as fast as my legs would carry me, but that wasn't good enough. Knowing I wouldn't get to the person on time, I dove forwards, skidded across the rough ground. My fingertips touched theirs, but a hand grabbed my ankle to pull me away so fast I couldn't react. My entire body tossed aside with that same cackling laugh coming from the woods. I stood up, fuming, seeing red. I got turned around when I was thrown and didn't have the slightest clue where the injured person got dragged off to. Stop messing around and show yourself! I shouted into the woods, voice becoming hoarse. That person needs treatment, you bastard! I stood waiting for a response, chest heaving with each breath. A twig snapped behind me and I lost any sense of bravery I once had. The cold air stinging my sweaty face, making my shoulders shake. I listened for more footsteps. When none came, I started running again. In a few steps, a set of powerful hands grabbed me from behind. I shut my eyes, just in time. Those hands kept me in place and tilted my head back, forcing me to look upwards if I kept my eyes open. Oh, how quick of you. Here, I wanted to keep you. What? Do me a favor and open your eyes for a few seconds. The low, raspy voice let out a laugh that made my entire body react in a negative way. My teeth chattered, but I kept my eyes shut and waited in the darkness for this monster to do something. Give back the driver, I demanded, but not sounding brave at all. They break the law. Are you going to... What's the word? Arrest them. I gave you a chance to leave on your own. Why try and rescue a human like that? Hmm? The monster questioned. More hands fell on my arms. They gripped just tight enough to be painful. Another set of hands came to my face to run long fingers around my cheeks, making me try and move out of their grasp without any luck. My job is to serve and protect. I need to protect that driver from you, I explained, finding at least some strength to put into that statement. Protect a criminal, it said in an amused voice. I don't get to pick and choose. It's serve and protect for everyone. If not, there isn't any point to it now, is there? In an ideal world, that would be true. 
I knew at some point in my life I may come across a vile human that didn't deserve my service. I hope that never happened while I worked with a small police task force. The driver did break the law and endanger other lives, but that didn't mean they should be condemned to death for it. I heard the monster laugh again. Something got close to my face, and I felt soft fabric brush up against my cheek. I'll make a deal with you, little human. Open your eyes, and I'll return the driver. The voice said in a low whisper, directly in my ear, causing me to shudder. I swallowed hard. Opening my eyes meant dying, or something I didn't even want to think of. And this monster might not even be telling the truth. The choice heavy in the air and the creature waited patiently for my answer. At least I didn't have anyone to miss me. Rusty would get over his new partner not coming out of these woods soon enough. My nephews were young enough to forget about me in time. I cracked my eyes open, seeing white in the darkness. Before I opened them the rest of the way, something came over them to cover my sight. I felt the monster come closer, the veils it wore spilling over my face, the arms bringing my body closer against it, something that felt like a pile of thick branches all jabbing into my back. I waited for the monster to remove the hand from my eyes, expecting death, and then a soft feeling came to my forehead as if something had pressed into it. What a silly little thing you are. Didn't even try to bargain. Taking you now will simply be a waste. I'll enjoy tormenting you. But for now, you held up your end of the deal. You may leave. All those hands fell onto my back and pushed me forwards. Something happened to all the strength in my body. I fell forwards completely limp, smashing my face into a ground much harder than the forest ground. I stayed on the ground, dazed as pain slowly came in waves. A rough set of arms picked me up and back on my feet. Rusty shoved some napkins against my bloody nose, trying to clean my face up. He wasn't very gentle, and I think he made it worse. What in fuck's name happened? He demanded. I knew he was angry that I ran off into the woods. Well, I stepped on the grass. But that counted, so I'd been snatched up by the forest. He was shocked I came out alive. I shook my head of the hazy feeling to look around for the driver. I found myself standing on the empty highway. The car still crashed against the tree and our cruiser flashing lights off to the side. The driver, I... The monster said it would give them back. I stammered, not seeing the other person. On cue, the monster held up its end of the deal. A loud crack rang out when a shape literally fell from the sky. Rusty jumped away, cursing. No one could blame him for that. I collapsed back to the ground, seeing a broken body of the person I'd wanted to save. If they were alive before the fall, the hard ground took care of that. Blue and red lights covered the silent scene, and Rusty needed to drag me to my feet again. He let me sit in the car, trying to process everything that had happened. Due to this stretch of road being home to some supernatural creatures, people were in place to clean up the mess they caused. The body taken and returned to the family to be buried. The cause of death listed as a car crash, due to the man's drinking and driving. Our dash cam didn't record much past us driving by the mangled car due to a manufacturing issue. At least that's what was released. In truth, when the forest took me, all the electronics in the area got fried. I needed a new phone, and Rusty told me I needed to get 
used to that sort of thing when dealing with this job. My partner suggested I took a day off. I refused. The morning after the incident, I was coming out of the station at the end of my shift, ready to go home, and then go to work that night. On the way out, I ran into something I was not expecting to see again. The white-haired child from before. He scowled, seeing me, and I stopped on the steps, blocking the door by accident. Is your partner in? He asked, trying to sound reasonable. No, he already left. Uh, Do you want me to leave a message? I offered, looking down at him. I held on to a small bag with a donut inside. Someone did a coffee run and got it for me just before I left. The boy's eyes kept darting towards the bag, but was too proud to ask for it. No, I wanted to give him some updated information. I refuse to help you, and my words are a great help. I can wait until a later time to tell him, he said and made a motion to leave. Uh, do you want this? I'll trade it for some information about what I saw last night, I said, feeling as tired as I sounded. He took five seconds to think of the offer. The bag snatched out of my hand, and he waited for me to speak again. I didn't really know what to ask, so I went for the first thing. What was that monster I saw last night? He, he had a lot of arms and veils, I think? I questioned. He waved a hand as if this wasn't an important question, but answered anyways. That is the forest itself. He is made up of things found in the woods. Spider silk hair and veils. Antlers for a body. And anything else it can collect. I believe it's just a body made to speak with humans on a more even level. You could never fully understand what the forest really is, and this is the closest thing to a form your human mind can deal with, the boy said, ready to leave. Human arms, though? How how does it get a hold of those? It's not really as if they're part of the woods. The child stopped, giving me an intense look through his white hair. Hikers go missing all the time. Their bodies are eaten by animals, but also used by the forest for other purposes. I did not like that mental image at all. The boy reached into the bag to grab out his breakfast without caring. He dropped one of the creepiest statements I had ever heard. I shook my head, wanting to remove the thought. I thought the woods were, like, peaceful and all that. Why is the body of the woods all freaky instead of, I don't know, like, some pretty tree lady? I asked, causing the small king to look at me mid-bite. Peaceful? Nature is an unforgiving cycle of life and death. You should not place your human ideals upon it. He went back to eating, and I got tempted to pat his head again. No matter how hard he tried sounding like this big, scary king, he really just looked like any other good kid. He noticed my hand raising slightly, and backed away before I could reach him. I'll give you a free warning. You need to leave now, or you'll be unable to the next time you encounter something supernatural. You have a hint of the forest smell on you now. The more often you encounter things of the night, the more likely you'll become a target of them. Now that you are aware of them, you cannot go back to how it was before. You can only try and find a place where they are less common. Save yourself now, or risk being devoured the next time the forest turns an eye towards you. His tone dark and statements grim. I was scared of what he said, and yet I couldn't take it entirely seriously because he had a bit of the chocolate glaze on the corner of his mouth. I reached out to clean it off with a cuff of my sleeve, causing him to get angry with me again. Uh, what's your name? Rusty never told me. I asked the boy, who fumed, face red. Ellie! Don't treat me like a child! He shouted, then realized his mistake. Rusty didn't tell me his name because he knew how I would react to it. My face lit up and smile grew wide. With another groan of anger, the small boy started stomping away, trying to look at my expression. Ellie's a cute name! I called after him. Eat it! I made a very powerful enemy that day. 
And yet I didn't care. I needed to hide treats in our car in case we saw him again. Rusty is going to kill me, though, for how I treated Ellie. I just couldn't help it. Cute kids should be treated as such. I felt a little sorry for the boy for being in his position. He tried so hard to act like an adult. He really should be in school having fun with friends, not running around alone dealing with monsters. I was aware that what Ellie said was true. If I stayed working on this job, I risked my life. Then again, I knew there was always a risk when I became a deputy. Now I just added a new option of how I could be killed to the list. I left the station more worried about how Rusty would ream me out for my actions that morning than any kind of supernatural threat. I'd finished my book of crossword puzzles faster than expected. I didn't have time to get a new book for my next shift, meaning I would be very bored at night. I met up with Rusty, and he shoved a bundle of books into my chest. I looked them over, finding them to be some old word search books. Some with pages torn out or puzzles already finished. I wanted to point out these facts, but knew Rusty would give me some attitude if I brought it up. I think he rescued the books from a recycling bin somewhere. Eh, at least I had something to do. I didn't really have a chance to look at the books. For once, we were a bit busy on that long stretch of highway, actually doing our jobs. There were a few drunk drivers and people speeding. We found out some sort of bonfire party was happening, and that's where all the trouble came from. Sure enough, a call came in for a large, loud gathering of underage kids drinking. We needed to wait on a few other police to help break up the party. I don't want to spoil anyone's fun, but this party got dangerous and stupid. The teens created a fire too large that nearly burned down the woods if we hadn't gotten the call that we did. The Tower of Flames scorched some of the nearby leaves, and I thought it was a miracle nothing burned down before we got there. The morons were also putting spray paint cans in the flames, which could have killed someone. Besides a few drunk and scared kids who wanted to throw some punches, we didn't bother arresting anyone for the underage drinking. We just made sure they were collected by their parents or a sober driver. The fire department had been called already. The firemen got right to work to put out the bonfire, cursing the ones who thought it was a good idea to start one in the middle of the woods. It was one of the more exciting shifts, but in a normal sense. I expected this sort of thing when I signed up for the job. Not monsters in the woods. On the way back for the night, we drove down the highway, our clothing smelling of smoke. I got started on notes for our reports, so I didn't notice what Rusty saw along the road until he started to pull over. I looked up to see a car just sitting abandoned. It was morning, but we still had a few hours before the sun rose. The car sat empty. All doors open, but no lights on. Rusty got out and I followed him, wondering if someone just got into car trouble, or if this was a dumped, stolen car. Rusty was tense his hand hovering over his gun, and I did the same thing, unsure of what to expect. I followed behind him and got out my flashlight to see the car better. Strange things happened on this long stretch of highway. I'd already experienced two weird nights, but Rusty said supernatural things didn't happen often. I must be lucky that I already had seen so much in such a short time being on the force. I stopped beside the back seat of the car and shone my flashlight inside. The inside was dirty and the seat torn up in one spot. This had to be someone dumping a stolen car. If it wasn't stolen, then the owner would have brought it in to be recycled. Metal prices around here were worth the cost of towing a car. Most people needed the money, so even if they only got 30 bucks after paying for the towing, they would put in the effort to bring it to the scrapyard. Why waste the time getting it all the way out here if it wasn't stolen? Should we call in for a tow? I asked Rusty. I didn't dare touch the car and just 
kept looking it over. The thing looked like it had sat outside for a while. Some rust starting around the wheels and a bird's nest stuck in the empty back taillight. Get back to our car, Rusty hissed in a low voice. I've never heard from him before. I froze, not understanding what had made him suddenly so upset. He was looking off into the overgrown field on the side of the road, his flashlight catching something in the dark. A shape moved in the tall grass, and I moved a few steps closer to our car. I jumped in fear when a dark form jumped into the road. Here I was hoping I wouldn't come across anything strange for a while. I stared at the monster, unsure of what I was seeing. The thing looked far too pointed to be anything but natural. The thing looked far too pointed to be anything natural. It was almost like a pitch-black wolf, and yet wrong. The snout long and came to a sharp point, along with the ears. The body of spiky fur... Being supported on legs became pencil thin, and the paws weren't there. Just small, needle thin points sticking into the ground. The tail long and flowing, also ending in a sharp point. The face turned towards my own, the red eyes almost as expressive as a human's. You get head start. Run. The monster spoke in a voice much like a wheezing laugh. I looked at Rusty to catch his eyes. There were more of these creatures in the fields, and we couldn't take them all. Could we get past this one to get to our car? Rusty aimed his sidearm and fired. The thing jumped around in the road, laughing at us. No matter how hard Rusty tried to hit this monster, it was too fast. I considered our options. Run and get eaten, or try for the car and get eaten. Then another option came to us, one I didn't want to take, but might be the only way to get out of this alive. Well, not alive, but maybe end in the death that wasn't being eaten by these wrongly shaped wolves. A pale white hand waved at us from behind the trees in the forest. I knew it belonged to the monster of the forest I'd come across before. I didn't want to deal with that thing either. A wolf came forwards and tore off a piece of Rusty's sleeves and gave him a minor cut. We didn't have a choice but to run. I rushed around the old car and grabbed my partner by the back of his shirt. He wasn't easy to get moving. More of those wolves came from the grass, drool dripping down from their sharp mouths, catching the light of the moon. Soon Rusty was the one dragging me alone and into the woods. These creatures hot on our trail, laughing the entire time. Black shapes darted through the trees. I heard them jumping around behind us, slamming into the bark, causing leaves and small branches to fall down. We ran hard, and for someone his size, Rusty kept up pretty well. My chest ached, wanting a break. The laughing coming from behind us kept me going. In sheer fear, I pressed on, convinced the moment we stopped, we were dead. My partner snagged a branch and faltered for a second. And that was all it took. One of those dark wolves came down from the trees and onto Rusty, knocking him to the ground. I shouted and drew my gun. I fired shots into the monster at such a close range I knew I hit it even in the dark. The monster looked up and met my eyes with dark red ones. A grin came over its pointy face that caused the eyes to nearly close in glee. It let out a long laugh and jumped away. I didn't know if these things were playing or really wanted to kill us. Might as well be both. I got down to help Rusty and see what the wolf did to him in the few seconds of attacking. His back was covered in cuts, and I went seeing a large puncture wound on his shoulder. I grabbed his good arm and put it over my shoulder, half dragging the larger man along into a clearing. Rusty made an effort to stand up. 
I faced my back to him and he did the same, trying for us to be able to cover each other's blind spots. My hands trembled slightly, listening to that never-ending laughter out of the woods. Red eyes moved in the dark, their voices mocking us. We needed to do something. I doubted my gun would be enough to kill one of these monsters, let alone a pack of them, after one literally laughed off a few bullets. A wolf got brave and darted into the clearing. I acted too slow. These bastards far too fast for me to react. The wolf grabbed Rusty by the leg and he fell to the ground, but he also pressed a gun to the thing's forehead and fired, which was impressive of him. The wolf backed off, spraying black blood and laughing the entire time it ran back into the woods. <laughs> what the hell are these things? I questioned nearly out of breath. I got down low trying to see the damage the sharp teeth did to my partner's leg. His ankle was bleeding pretty badly. No idea. They're not from around here. Rusty replied, sounding awful. I started to think we weren't going to get out of here alive. My thoughts were almost confirmed by another wolf coming in. I fired and it did nothing. The thing reached my injured partner, pushing him back to the ground hard enough to knock him out. I jumped on the monster, arms wrapped around its neck, and spiky fur jabbing into my body. It yelped in shock and started to buck, trying to get me off. I held on fast, legs flailing. I needed to wrap them around the thin body to stay on. It ran around in circles, no longer laughing, but the others in the trees did. The bunch never saw anything so funny. As long as I kept this thing from eating Rusty, and kept the others amused, I was fine with them cackling. My arms burning from the effort of holding the beast, but I refused to let it go. It even rolled on its back a few times, jabbing sharp rocks and twigs through my uniform. This sucked, but was better than getting eaten. I didn't have a clue how long it took for my strength to give out, and for my body to finally get tossed off, and very painfully up against a tree. The wolf just shook itself and started to head towards Rusty again. I shouted at it to stop, but I had not recovered enough to stand just yet. We not eat you. Only half-breed flesh tonight. The wolf snapped back, looking a little worn out from running around with me on its back. Half-breed? What was he talking about? I looked from him to Rusty, trying to figure it out. My partner looked pretty normal. Dirty brown hair and light skin. I didn't think he had anything but white toast DNA in him. Was this monster talking about something not human being a part of my trusted partner? I got to my feet, ready to defend Rusty again. The wolf also put up its guard, apparently not wanting to go through trying to get me off its back again. I nearly screamed when a soft fingertip touched my back from behind. A long, pale hand reached around a tree holding a circle made of white twigs twisted together. I looked at it confused. The hand used a finger to point over to the wolf while still holding on to the twigs. It opened its hand, and I caught it before the circle dropped to the ground. I held on to the thing made of twigs, thinking it was useless. The wolf froze in its tracks, and the laughing stopped. In the woods. What you have? The beast asked, looking worried. I took a step forward, and it took a step back. My heart going crazy in my chest from fear, and I refused to let it show after I somehow gained an upper hand. Faces of the other wolves came closer through the leaves and bushes, all very interested in what might happen in the next few seconds. We're not hungry. Just, uh... Oops. I'll sleep. Fun over. Okay, you... I jumped forwards, circle in hand, and the wolf let out an anguished cry. 
By some miracle, I caught it before it ran and got a grip on it. I forced the collar made of branches around the monster's neck, listening to a horrible, howling sound coming from it. I hated the sound. It was as if I was kicking a poor dog. Once the collar was in place, the beast tensed up like a statue. Slowly it tipped over, falling to the ground, legs stiff. It reminded me of a cat, after you put a sweater on it. I stood, breathing hard, waiting for the wolf to do something. Soon the legs started to move, making it kick around in a circle in the dirt. It almost looked funny in a pathetic way. The sun started to rise over the trees, making the wolves scatter, each going off with a weird laugh, as if they were just as confused as I felt leaving the scene behind. The sun started to rise over the trees, making the other wolves scatter, each going off with a weird laugh, as if they were just as confused as I felt, leaving the scene behind. The one with the new collar finally got up and bolted, running into a tree or two as it fled. That was weird. Really weird. I didn't have time to worry about what had just happened. I needed to get Rusty out of the woods. I carefully woke him up and helped him to his feet. In the gray morning light, his wounds looked better than I thought they were before. We hobbled through the woods, completely lost. A hand came from behind the trees, and I started towards it. Rusty pulled back, but I pushed him forwards. This time, the hands helped me out. At least I thought so. I didn't know what the collar did, or if the wolves left because the sun started to come up. I followed the hands, and they guided us to the road nearby our parked car. I watched some dark shapes in the overgrown field, pushing the car that made a stop in the first place with their sleek pointed bodies. In the last shadows of the night, they disappeared along with the old worn out car, these wolves taking the prop they used to lure in victims with them. I gave one last glance back towards the woods and saw a single hand peeking out from a tree. It must have noticed my gaze and gave a thumbs up which I returned behind Rusty's back. I didn't know why the creature of the forest helped this time around. Things that lurked in the night sure are fickle. I got my partner home, but he refused to make a report about his injuries or go to the hospital. He really didn't look all that bad, considering. So I left him alone to go home, unable to sleep from being so wired after the previous night's events. I treated my own cuts and bruises, then made an attempt to rest. I gave up around dinner time, only getting a few hours of sleep. I knocked on Rusty's door, making him regret the fact I knew where he lived. I'd brought some pizzas with me, thinking it might put him in a better mood. He took them from my hands and considered slamming the door on my face. We sat on his front porch and I kept a close eye on him, seeing how badly hurt he was. I wanted to bring up something. He must have known and refused to speak until I did. Uh, so... One of those things last night... called you something... weird. I said, feeling just as scared digging around in my partner's personal life as I did while defending him from wolves. A half-breed? He asked, not skipping a beat. Yeah. That. He let out an annoyed noise that nearly made me run down the front porch. He didn't want to tell me this, and I really didn't have any right knowing something so personal. <sighs> my mother wasn't human. My father was. I have no idea what she was, and she left pretty soon after I was born. Aside from healing up pretty fast, I don't have any other special powers from her, he explained. Well, at least now I knew I didn't have a cool partner with supernatural powers to fight creatures of the night. That sounded fun in theory, but after the few encounters, I didn't want to deal with any monsters again. 
half or otherwise. Why did the woods help us out last night? He asked, and I shook my head. No idea. I hope you knew. I'm guessing whatever's in those woods wanted to kill me with its own two hands. Or it has a crush on me. I added the last part as a joke. Rusty nodded, and I wanted to scream. He should not have agreed with me on that last statement. I might be alright with making friends with a forest monster, but how would anyone even go about dating such a thing, even if they were interested? No. That thing needed to want to kill me. The other alternative frightened me too much. After I knew my partner was going to be alright for tonight's shift, I left, ready to see him in a few hours. He warned me to stay away from the woods, and I still had time to request a transfer. I wondered if I really could do that. It already felt too late for me to leave this town behind, creatures and all. I arrived back to my apartment, keys in hand, wanting to get some more sleep before work. A shape by my door made me stop in my tracks. Something dark black sat outside my apartment. It wasn't the same shape as the wolves last night, or big enough to be one. I thought someone's dog got out. I carefully walked over to it, the black dog raising its head. I reached down to check the collar for a tag to find nothing. The collar feeling old and worn, the edges frayed along the sides. Bringing a strange dog inside your place wasn't really a good idea, but I didn't want it running off before I got animal control over to bring it to a shelter. I opened my apartment door, and the dog walked right inside as if it owned the place. It walked over to the couch, sitting down in seconds of coming inside. We both stared at each other, as if it expected me to say something. I looked it over, trying to figure out the breed. It looked like a type of husky, but black with shorter fur. It must be some sort of mutt with all these weird features. The mouth open, showing off perfect white teeth. Are you hungry? What you have? The dog answered back. I jumped back against my front door, face drained of color and dropping my phone in the process, my mouth too dry to speak. It took me a few seconds to recover enough to find any words. Uh, you just... I started, then it sank in. This dog sounded like the black wolf from the night before. You put color on me. I am in service of you. First, we eat. What you have? It asked again, teeth showing. God damn it. I didn't have time for a dog, let alone whatever this thing was. I don't suppose if I take off that collar you'll just... leave, I suggested. No, I eat you. Well, I'll need to figure something else out. I didn't really have much at my place, so the dog needed to wait until I came back with some roasted chickens from the grocery store nearby. At least they had deals on buying two of them. I even looked up to make sure the spices on which chickens were dog-friendly. I got back and my new pet wasted no time in eating two whole chickens, bones and all. I patted his back as he ate, warning him to rest afterwards. I heard dogs or other small animals can really mess up their stomachs if they ate too fast and then ran around after. Maybe that wasn't true, but I didn't want to risk hurting my pet soon after getting him, unwanted or not. I didn't want to leave him alone for the night while I went to work, but didn't have anyone to call over to watch my new talking pet. I put on the TV and that seemed to make him happy. His short attention span made a children's channel the best for him. I got ready for work and adjusted his collar making sure it wasn't too tight. At least with a talking pet, you can ask him if he needs to use the washroom. I left him alone, wondering what kind of mess I might walk into when I got off work. 
I think the monster of the woods knew what I was doing. I mean, why kill or eat someone when you can make them suffer by forcing them to take care of a new supernatural dog? Rusty noticed my mood when I got into work and decided I didn't want to tell him about the dog right then. I needed to introduce him to the monster that almost ate him in a tactful way. I dreaded that almost as much as any new creatures we might come across on our job. Recently, I've been forced to adopt a dog. A big dog. And one that talked. And one that learned how to sing Baby Shark. I only had Spike for two days, but I already wanted to shoot myself. I took my new pet out for a walk right after getting home from my all-night shift. I figured it wasn't a good idea to go to bed without giving my pet a chance to stretch its legs and go to the bathroom outside. I stood by an open field near my apartment, leash in one hand and yawning away. Spike ran like the wind, shrieking out lyrics to his favorite song, knowing no one was around but his owner to hear him. At least he was smart enough not to talk around others. I wondered how long he needed to be out for. I felt drained from my weird previous shifts and needed to catch up on sleep. I didn't risk leaving Spike alone to find his own way back. I'm sure he could. He wasn't really a dog, but took the form of a black, husky-looking kind of breed. Because he appeared to be just a regular dog, that meant he could get taken to the pound if I left him out on his own. I really didn't want to risk someone taking him. He would follow anyone if they offered him food. Finally, Spike slowed down and paused in front of me. He panted away, and thankfully that made him stop singing. I felt bad for him that he was forced to be in my small apartment all alone when I worked. I needed to find a dog sitter that wouldn't get freaked out if they caught him singing or, well, doing any other stupid thing he was bound to do. Did you go to the washroom? Show me where so I can pick it up, I told him, still half asleep. I wasn't keen on the idea of cleaning up his mess, but I just couldn't leave it somewhere in the field. Ugh, ew, Spike responded, face twisted in disgust, which was impressive considering it was hard for dogs to look that disgusted. I don't like it either, but I can't just leave it here for someone to walk in or something. I told him, getting a little annoyed. I did not go here. Too open. I use the same room you do. Inside. My newly adopted supernatural pet informed me. I stood staring at him for at least a minute, trying to put what he said together in my mind. Was he implying that he used the bathroom like a person? I would be happy if that was the case, but confused on how he figured that out. And why didn't he tell me sooner he could do that? I bought plastic dog bags for nothing. He lived in the woods before, right? Was he comfortable going outside before, but not now that he had options? I can't believe I needed to think of my pet's washroom preferences so early in the damn morning. You think I go outside? Like an animal? Then you steal it away? With your hands? Spike said, his shrill voice getting louder in disbelief. I tried to hush him and looked around the empty street near the field, hoping no one would walk by and hear him. He was so grossed out over the idea of me cleaning up after him, he started to cough and gag, his dog appearance faltering, showing the sharp and pointed creature he really was. I let him dry heave and make awful sounds for a bit. I needed to explain to him that I would use a bag, and every dog owner does the same. Well any good dog owner. That made him actually puke over the thought. I started to wonder if being eaten or killed would have been easier than dealing with him going forward. After our little talk, I put his leash back on to get him home. He wanted a second breakfast, and I felt too tired to say no. We walked by the nearby corner store and bumped into someone I didn't expect to see outside of work. Rusty, my partner, came out of the store with breakfast of his own. I glanced at his bag, seeing 
coffee-flavored drinks and boxes of honey buns. I didn't think he would be the kind of guy with a sweet tooth. Maybe he had family over. Come to think of it, I didn't even know if he was married or not. I noticed too late he was staring daggers at Spike. Two nights ago, Spike's pack had attacked Rusty, and if it wasn't for him being a half-breed of some sort, he might not have made it out of the woods. And now I stood in front of him holding a leash with one of his attackers on the other end. Maybe because Spike looked like a dog, Rusty wouldn't figure out the truth. Breakfast, Spike said and snatched one of the boxes out of Rusty's bags. Within seconds, he'd torn it open with his sharp teeth. I started to sweat, fearing Rusty's anger more than anything else. At least I thought I did. The look of disappointment hit harder than anger. I, uh, he... I started trying to explain myself. Uh, I'll pay you back, I finished, unsure what else to say. Oh, you will, Rusty said and left us behind without another word. Spike might not be able to attack and eat me with the collar I put on him, but he's going to be the cause of my death at some point. I wrestled the plastic wrappers away from him and dragged the hyper-creature back home. I didn't really sleep much because of the sugar high Spike got from his stolen treats. I feared Rusty's mood for the night. He must have known and stayed extra silent when I got into the station. If he just got the payback over with, I wouldn't be suffering this much, expecting it. The wait for him to snap was much worse than anything he might be able to think of. I wanted to clear the air and talk about why my hand was forced, adopting Spike, but we got pulled aside. One of the dispatch workers wanted to talk to us about doing a special job that night. As far as I could tell, only a handful of people within the station knew about the supernatural stuff that went down on occasion. Could you guys, uh, go out tonight and just drive along the roads? Clover came by and should have made it over to his other stop by now. Normally we'd just assume he stopped along the way to collect something he found in the woods. But with the forest acting all riled up lately, it's best to double check on him. The dispatch worker explained. Her name tag said Mary and she was on the shorter side. I have never heard her voice on the radio before, and we hadn't met yet. With how young she sounded, I bet it was hard for the other officers to take her seriously. Clover? I asked, and they both looked in my direction. He's a traveling merchant of sorts. We'll order special spell work and materials to make... Sam doesn't need to know about any of that. Rusty interrupted Mary. I suddenly felt tense from how they looked at each other. Since I found out about the whole supernatural thing being real, Rusty hadn't really told me much. I did try looking stuff up, but who knows what was real and what wasn't. And Spike didn't tell me much either. He just ate chicken and sang dumb songs. He should know a little if you two are going to be working on that highway. Things have already happened. I agreed with you before when he didn't see anything weird, but hasn't he already had direct contact with the forest? Mary questioned, her shorter frame and childlike voice somehow threatening. He's not a part of the cleanup crew, or deals with the same tasks you do. I'll tell him how to handle any magic weapons if we ever need to use them. But you know how this works. The more he knows, the more likely he'll need to use that information. Rusty said back, trying to keep his voice even. I understand trying to protect the rookie, but letting him know certain things isn't going to lead him down the same path as Quinn. I knew others in the station weren't listening to us, but the mention of a certain name made all sound disappear from our surroundings. I tensed up, stomach nodded, and I took a step closer to Mary on reflex. I knew Rusty wouldn't hurt her for dropping that name, but I was still worried over his reaction to it. Quinn was Rusty's partner before I started. To be honest, I didn't know anything about him. I didn't even have the guts to look up his full name. On my second day, someone else mentioned him and I saw the look in Rusty's eyes. Whatever happened in the past was pretty bad to make him look like that. A white-hot rage and regret boiled under his skin. 
I'll tell him what he needs to know when we get there. Rusty said, his voice so even it scared me. Mary didn't look intimidated in the slightest. I respected her for that. She's either very brave or dense. Rusty turned on his heel and walked away. I followed behind him knowing our night would be pretty silent and awkward, unless we found this clover person. I didn't know how to deal with my silently fuming partner. We got our car, and I let him drive down the highway because he knew Clover's route. And if he kept his hands on the steering wheel, he couldn't smack me if I looked in his direction the wrong way. The sun set, and we ended up driving around for an hour before finding something out of place. Rusty noticed it right away and pulled off to the side of the road. We both got out of the car, but... Rusty stayed back a few feet just in case. A motorcycle sat on the side of the road without the owner in sight. A rolled up bag tied to the back of the seat and two reflective clover stickers on the license plate. I knew right away this belonged to the person we were sent out to find, but I didn't see any trace of them. Rusty placed a hand on his sidearm but didn't draw it. His body tense and head slowly moving, trying to spot any nearby danger. What's... I was about to ask Rusty the plan when a scream came from the forest. I wanted to run towards it, but I'd learned my lesson from the last time I raced headfirst into the forest. I waited for my partner to give me a nod. Uh, Let me get a few things and we'll go, he said and went back to the car. He pulled a shotgun I've never seen from a false bottom in the trunk. My mouth opened a little from the offense of there being a special weapon hidden away. He grabbed a silver chain and shoved it into my hand. He then closed the trunk after getting a box of shells to put into his pocket. Does the shotgun have, like, magic shells? I asked, keeping up with Rusty's quick pace into the sea of trees. He looked over his shoulder and I grabbed my flashlight so we could see where to go. He debated on how much he wanted to tell me. No, to salt. Creatures don't all have the same weaknesses. Most of them don't like salt, silver, or iron. Salt is usually the best bet. It doesn't really kill often, but it pisses things off just enough for them to leave. Well, that was good to know. I held up my hand and showed him the chain he gave me. I dangled a little and I tightened my fist around it, worried I might drop it. What's this for? I asked him, a bit glad Rusty finally felt like telling me something useful. It's blessed. Weaker creatures won't want to go near you. If you're concerned, wrap it around your fist and punch something. Again, it won't kill anything overly strong, but it should stun the creature long enough for you to run, he explained. I wrapped the chain around my hand as tight as it would go, I even looped it around my fingers, hoping the delicate thing wouldn't snap. We kept walking as we spoke, and didn't see anything odd or hear another scream since entering the woods. Why a chain? Wouldn't, like, brass knuckles be better? Rusty stopped, trying to listen to a slight rustle off in the trees. When he knew nothing wanted to jump on us, he answered my question. The blessing only sticks to pure items. Brass knuckles are made to cause pain. Now stop asking questions. Just shoot anything that... Rusty did not get to finish the sentence. A crashing came through the bushes. I didn't even have time to grab my gun when a wild, raging buck charged right at us. Rusty acted fast and pushed me out of the way. I fell backwards as my partner stopped the buck dead in its tracks. I shouted his name when I saw the cost of such an action. Antlers tore into Rusty's shoulder and arm, leaving deep gouges out of his left side. He strained, keeping the creature back, his feet getting pushed a few inches, leaving trails in the dirt. The buck didn't look right. The fur appeared too gray, and a terribly strong, rotting smell came from it. A screech came from the trees, and I needed to turn away from Rusty to see the source of it. A large owl came swooping down, eyes glowing red, giving me a target in the dark. 
I shot it and the thing fell from the sky. The body tripled the size of a normal owl, the claws razor sharp. The creature burst into a puff of black smoke and bones crumbling the moment it hit the ground. I turned to raise my gun to help my partner to see he had things under control. With a loud yell of effort, he wrapped strong arms around the buck's head and twisted. A loud crack echoed through the trees, and the creature fell apart, flesh disintegrating, and bones falling to the ground. Holy shit! I gasped, mostly to myself. Rusty, are you... His wounds looked too deep, and I brought the light over for a better look. To my shock, they started to close up. He healed way faster than he did two nights ago with the pointed wolves. I get a slight boost in strength and healing when the moon is full, he said, brushing off my concerns. His face covered in sweat, but otherwise, Rusty looked ready to keep going. A slight boost? Jesus, Rusty, that was slight? He told me he didn't have any super strength and then pulled a stun like this. Did Rusty think what he just did wasn't all that impressive? He noticed my look and narrowed his eyes in confusion. I didn't voice any of my questions, knowing we needed to keep moving. I relied on my partner's eyes in the dark. Even with the flashlight, I didn't have a clue on where the missing clover might have gone. Rusty heard a noise before I did, and started quickly to run towards it. I followed behind, finding it hard to keep up. I started to really hate running through the woods at night, and never wanted to do it again. We stumbled into a scene of a person dressed in riding gear, backing away from more of those dark and half-rotten animals. He had a smoking pine branch in front of him, waving it to keep the creatures away, a black helmet with the visor down, making it impossible to see his face. He let out another scream of fear when a dark crow swooped down to steal away his only defense. He literally got backed into a corner when we arrived. Rusty fired the shotgun into the crowd of creatures, some of the wild shot hitting Clover, and he raised his arms up cursing. His leather jacket mostly protecting him from the sharp salt. That hurts me too! Clover shouted, his voice muffled behind the helmet. Rusty ignored him. The salt left smoking wounds on the rotting animals, and they turned towards us. I suddenly lost all my courage, with all those dead eyes in our direction. I nearly fell to my knees from fear. Rusty shoved the shotgun into my shaking hands so hard against my chest, it knocked some sense back into me. He then ran forwards to punch the first undead animal in the face, breaking the neck right away. I shot into the crowd and away from Rusty in order to make a path for Clover to run through. He got a few more bits of salt into his jacket, but at least I got him over and to hide behind me. Rusty, let's get the hell out of here, I called the moment Clover was safe next to me. My partner's knuckles bloody from the fight. He'd been bitten a few times, but his wounds were healing faster than I expected. He slammed down his fist into another buck, threatening to impale him, the creature's head crashing down into the packed dirt, the sound of the skull breaking making me swear to never piss off my partner. We were about to run, but it seemed like the boss arrived to the fight late. The other animals scattered when a large shape tore through the trees. Some of the smaller ones got crushed under massive paws of the creature that arrived to kill us. I shot first, so Rusty could get a few feet away, but the salt didn't do much against the monster in front of us. The thing was double the size it should have been, and the red eyes glowed in the dark. I'd never been this close to a bear before, and never wanted to be near one again. The monster opening its mouth to let out a roar that shook the trees. I flinched at the sound. 
there was no way we could get away from this thing. We could only piss it off more. Fear ripping through my body, I looked at my worn out and bloody partner, then at the shaking clover standing behind me. He was shorter than myself and so thin under his leather outfit. He didn't stand a chance of even handling the recoil from the shotgun, let alone fighting against this bear. I looked at his waist seeing pouches and prayed he had something useful inside them. We really need some sort of powerful magic weapon right now. By sheer luck, the bear didn't attack just yet. Rustling came from the trees, and I looked up at the same time Rusty and Clover warned me to keep my eyes down. I found myself staring at a monster more terrifying than the undead bear in front of us. Everything else faded away, only leaving the sight of the creature hanging upside down from the branches using countless human arms. The face covered with layers of glittering veils. Antlers sticking out from behind the head, twisted into each other and forming a circle. My chest grew tight, and it felt like something started to fill my lungs. Something solid that twisted through my veins, creeping towards my heart. Hands from behind covered my eyes and jerked my head back. The feeling of the vines inside my chest faded, and I snapped out of that strange trance I found myself in. Voices started shouting, but I missed most of what was said for a few seconds. You know what you stole from me. Give it back, rotten creature. I knew that voice. It was the same one that belonged to the forest creature from before. Did I just see part of what it really looked like? I did a fair and even trade. Clover shot back. Being blind, I wasn't aware the forest creature came down from the trees until it wrapped hands onto my shoulders to use my body as a support to glare down the man behind me. Nothing fair with tricky words. I wanted arms! The forest shouted back with all those hands gripping onto me so tightly it hurt. At least the anger was directed at someone else. I didn't even think the creature realized I was even there due to its rage. I gave you arms. You never said you wanted them to be my own. Clover argued, but his hands were pulled away. I could see again and looked over the situation. Clover had been picked up by the forest monster I'd gotten a brief look at, and Rusty was backed up against a tree, the bear letting out a deep howl. I needed to think fast. At this rate, we wouldn't make it out of these woods, and the creature would gain a few more limbs. What did he take? I asked quickly to the forest creature. I looked up, trying not to look at it directly. I hadn't seen the lower half of the monster yet. It turned a veiled head down, my eyes landing on it. The same feeling came crawling into my chest. It almost became impossible to breathe, but I kept my gaze upwards. The creature so close, I debated on using my silver chain, but knew it wouldn't do anything besides make our situation worse. It is in his pocket. I cannot take it back because we had a trade. But I can take his life. It is all fair when it comes to. I cut off the creature by reaching out to grab a hold of the pouches at Clover's waist to look through them. He weakly protested, his body being held up by a pair of hands around his neck and under his helmet. I dumped out stones, pressed flowers, and hunks of pure salt. He kicked his legs, trying to make me stop. And I really hoped what I was giving back to the forest wouldn't come biting me in the ass. I didn't have much time to find out whatever this thing wanted. Clover losing strength and the bear starting to get closer to Rusty. That! That! The forest monster pointed out a pale hand at the small golden glowing bottle I pulled from the bottom of the pouch. I held out the tiny thing, but the creature shook its head and demanded I open the bottle. The excited hands dropped Clover, his body landing hard to the ground. He shouted at me to stop, but I ignored him, really hoping that this was the best course of action. I pulled the cork out of the small bottle, and the glass shattered in my hand. A blinding light came over my vision, and it took a few moments until I could see again. The undead bear disappeared in the new golden light leaving nothing behind. Rusty sank to the ground, shielding his eyes from the light. 
Clover's head was also down, and I was the only one looking around. My eyes adjusting to the light, finding the small space around us to be as bright as a spring day. I looked around, stunned at the sudden change. A breeze blew, kicking up flower petals that weren't there before, and bringing sweet scents of spring with it. I heard a laugh that was like wind chimes and looked up. The forest creature changed its body and was flying through the air between trees, the long body now similar to a serpent. The veils of spider web and antlers still attached to its head, but the rest of the body changed into something made of countless flowers as bright as the sun through leaves on a summer day. The long body flew through the air and came towards me. I tensed up, expecting it to crash into my body, but it just circled around me, creating a small updraft of petals. With one last laugh, it flew off deep into the woods, the light and spring day following it. We were left in darkness. Everything that bright light brought up with it was gone from around us. And we were all very rudely removed from the woods. The world turning under my feet and I fell downwards. With some luck, I flipped over and landed on my ass and not my head. Rusty landed on his feet, but Clover wasn't that lucky. He came crashing down last, neck breaking against the road with a shotgun. I dropped, clattering next to him. I screamed, seeing his body, and ran over to him. A terrible flashback of the drunk driver from the other night coming to mind. I screamed even louder when he sat up, head facing the wrong way. With some effort, he twisted his head back and pulled off his helmet. Rusty needed to smack me upside the back of my head to stop me screaming at what was under the visor the entire time. Black, wavy hair covered half of Clover's face. I wish he kept the helmet on. His skin clinging to his skull and lips peeled back, exposing teeth. Around his left eye, the skin had rotted away and he was missing his entire nose. A green eye set into his dark eye socket met my own, and I nearly fainted. At least I knew where he got his name from. Do you have any idea how much a spring day like that is worth? We could have bargained, Clover shouted, and he sounded pretty good for someone with exposed vocal cords. You're lucky we even bothered to save your ass. You're always getting into shit like this. What do you even need money for? Rusty shot back. Ah, don't be ignorant. Just because I'm... Clover started, but he stopped speaking when he noticed my face. I wasn't a sheepish person when it came to gore. I could watch zombie movies just fine, or clean up roadkill when needed. But it turned out I wasn't able to keep it together when a rotten human body moved around and spoke. The exposed muscles moving around caused my face to turn pale. Clover knew I was going to pass out before I realized it. He dove forwards to catch my head so it didn't smash against the road which we'd been tossed onto. I woke up in the backseat of our car, feeling sick and dizzy. Thankfully, Clover put his helmet back on, and since he was there, I figured I wasn't out for very long. Oh good, you're back. Let me take some blood. The undead creature said from under the visor. I jumped back and pressed against the seat trying to stay away from him. I suddenly did not trust the one we just saved. He held a syringe in his gloved hand, and Rusty, the traitor, grabbed a hold of me to drag me out of the car. With some screaming and begging, they got what they wanted. I rubbed my sore arm and was released back from the leather-clad zombie. Your eyes are green, Clover said and put the blood he stole away in one of his pouches. They're brown, I corrected. They were brown. Now they're green. I think it's because you looked at that forest body for too long. As far as I can tell, nothing else has changed. I can't sense any extra magic in your body, and nothing really feels off about you. If you're lucky, the color fades away in a few days. 
Clover explained, and I looked up at Rusty to have him silently confirm what was being said. We followed behind him and watched as he got back onto his bike. Eh, at least no one died tonight. And we got the job done. I glanced off into the woods and thought I saw a hint of light off in the distance. I'll get this tested for you and shoot you over the results when I get them. You're probably fine, he told us, and I thought I heard him mutter another probably. That stressed me out. Could be much worse, though. I reluctantly thanked Clover for checking such a thing for me, even though he owed us for saving him. We let him drive off after a small exchange of waves. I was left standing on the side of the road with Rusty staring down at me. His wounds healed, but they left blood on his torn uniform. Out of nowhere, his fist shot out and punched my shoulder. What the hell? I demanded, hurt on so many levels. Tell me next time you adopt a dog. I love dogs. With that, he turned to go back to the car. I was shell-shocked from the events that night, but also from his response. Really? He gave me the silent treatment over something like that? I hurried after him, ready for us to have a normal, quiet rest of our shift. We did need to pull over a few drivers, and Rusty let me write the tickets, because he didn't have a replacement shirt in the car. We pulled through the next few hours, and I got home a bit later than normal. We both needed to fill out an extra special report, because we dealt with something supernatural that night. I was so tired I barely paid any attention to what I filled out. I wanted to go right to bed, but remembered I needed to let Spike out. He got his leash and I took him to the field to run around to tire him out enough for me to sleep for a few hours. At least he found a new song to sing that was less annoying. Something about a duck. Being so tired, I didn't stress or worry about the events of the night. I was nearly asleep on my feet and collapsed on the couch and didn't make it to my bed. Instead of using my empty bed, Spike curled up on the couch next to me, nearly suffocating me in my sleep. <sighs> this dog was really going to be the death of me. We both stared at each other. We both stared as if we both stared as each other okay here we go we both stared at each other as if okay we both stared we both stared at each other and it was as if he expected We both stared as each other... <laughs> okay. Alright. This is the one. I didn't want to leave him alone for the night while I went to work, but didn't have anyone to call over to watch over talking... <laughs> uh, could you guys just go out tonight and just drive along the roads? Clover came by and should have made it over to his other stop by now. Normally we just assume he stopped along the way to collect something he found in the woods. But with the forest acting all riled up lately, it's best to double-check on him. The dispatch worker explained. <laughs> oh, it's a woman. 